Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Arjun Dhar, and with Julio, I am Speaker Secretary at the Cambridge University Law Society. Before I begin, I would like to thank our Speakers Program sponsor, Clifford Chance. Clifford Chance is a world-class law firm which values its relationship with the Cambridge University Law Society to secure some of the best and brightest future lawyers for its firm. Clifford Chance has opportunities for students from first year onwards. You can find out more by visiting their website. Today we have the pleasure of having Ray Tuff with us. He is a guest lecturer and former detective constable with the West Yorkshire Police. He will be talking to us today about the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper and we can't wait to hear from him. He will take some questions at the end, at which point we're going to turn off the recording and so please feel free to ask your questions freely. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ray Tuff. Good evening, everybody. And, uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Colts for inviting me to, uh, uh, to come and speak to you, which I have looked forward to for ages. I have to say, this has been the top of my agenda for a long time. This started off a year ago. I was doing a... I, I, my, my main um, source in doing these things is lecturing on cruise ships, but the audience is considerably older than you are. They're usually north of 65 and I'm not being <laughs> disrespectful, that's, that's how it is on cruise ships. But a year ago, a young man came up to me after the talk on this particular subject. He came up to me and proffered his hand, which I gladly accepted, told me how marvellous I was, which I accepted even more. And, uh, and I, I, I'm sort of looking back and thinking, don't mind me saying so, but you're a lot younger than everybody else who's just been in here. Uh, and what's your interest in this? I said, is it just this or any of the other talks? Because I do a, a, quite a lot of talks on similar, similar topics. And he said, no, it's this one, this one. And I said, are you a student? And he said, yes. And I said, law student? He said, yes. Whereabouts? Cambridge. That got my attention. Thought about it afterwards and I thought, well, and he told me the context that I'm not going to go on to that because we're going to cover it. Um, but I thought, if I approach uh, Cambridge... Uh, if I approach Cambridge and ask them whether this would be a, of benefit to, to students potentially, the worst anybody can ever say to me is no. But they didn't. They said yes. I spoke to Dr Morgan quite a few times spoke. We all speak on emails these days, don't we? I, I, we email, we swap to emails from time to time. He put me in touch with Coles and we're here now. So, just a bit of um, domestic stuff. Um, I'm happily retired. Uh, now, I've served in the West Yorkshire Metropolitan Force and before that a smaller city force, Leeds City Police, before the amalgamations took place in the early 1970s. I always wanted to be a detective, nothing more, never a chief constable, I just want to investigate crime and serious crime and I'm lucky because I did. I worked in Drug Squad and the Regional Crime Squad, which is the forerunner of the National Crime Agency, and I used to teach people how to follow people without them knowing they were being followed. That's the theory, it didn't always work out, but I did my best in teaching them, so here we are. Now, currently, uh, sorry, I, I'm looking around for I can't see it. Word to me, wife, <laughs> right at the back. I'm, I'm here with my wife, Angie, uh, and it was a massive, massive support to me. Uh, these talks take some, take some putting together, uh, they take hundreds of hours of research. I'd like to think that every single bit of what I'm going to tell you today is as accurate as I am aware of. There's nothing in it uh, that I'm going to sidetrack you with. No opinions of mine. This is all factual stuff. So um, there we go. I'm going to start now. I've got that off my chest. But I thought, oh, finally, and finally, because we are, we've been very kindly put up in Downing College, I treated myself to some Downing cufflinks. But more importantly, the suit I'm wearing tonight, lovely grey. It was actually made in Singapore for my daughter's wedding a few years ago. And it's true, one of my favorite countries. And I'm surrounded by people from Singapore, which is just, it's the icing on top of the cake. Anyway, here we go. Peter Sutcliffe was a psychopathic serial killer. When the first murder attributed to him happened in 1975, the phrase serial killer hadn't even been coined. There's no doubt at all, in my opinion, and most contemporary observers, that he killed or attempted to kill many more people than he was eventually charged with. In fact, quite recently, 
about 18 months ago, a new book has been published, and in it the authors list all the murders, in their opinions, that they believe Sutcliffe was responsible for. It's errant nonsense. It can't possibly have done them all. It's just a convenient way of blaming somebody who was in prison for uh, serial killing. I've read it, I analysed it, and I'm, I'm undecided. But, I mean, who knows? There's only one person who does, and he's in Durham Prison. I'm not a criminologist, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist, and I'm not going to delve into his mind, except in a general sense. There's no happy ending to this. There was never going to be. But in many ways, this talk is an overview, a precy of what happened and how he was brought to justice. Within the constraints of a 45-minute talk, it has to be. This is the story of lives wrecked, families torn apart by the actions of one man, and some observers have said, by the ineptitude and the intransigence of the police. With the benefit of hindsight, few would disagree with that. Hindsight can be a very overly used word, a cliche even, but not, I would venture to suggest in this case. But even to, even to now, th over 30 years after these crimes have happened, he still makes headlines, whilst his victims are forgotten about. In the words of the bard, "Twas ever thus." Can you, Julie? Can you go onto the map slide, please, Beth? So we're having to do this in two stages because that's misbehaving and that isn't. Anyway. My talks are never about me, uh, and they never will be. But it's relevant to say that I worked on this inquiry on three separate occasions. Not that I had a choice. Uh, I used to enjoy, if enjoy is the correct word, working on murder inquiries. Just bear with me a second while I do something else that's annoying me. Murders were good to work on. They enjoy, there's a, there's a massive feeling of satisfaction when you detect a murder and they engender a, a good camaraderie too. But on this one, we were up against it from the start and we didn't have a clue. It was always catch up. Sometimes seeing people months and months after a murder had taken place. And then when another one happened, it started all over again. This is a map of where he lived, was arrested, and where the murders took place. I very rarely use this, but he was from this neck of the woods. There were murders in all the highlighted ones. Leeds, Halifax, Huddersfield, Manchester, and eventually, for those of you who know the north of England, just outside Sheffield. When I was on a, a cruise ship a couple of years ago, a passenger uh, thoughtfully suggested it might be a good idea to have a map of where these locations were, uh, and I find it's of massive benefit. This is, of course, I know there are, there are quite a few international students here, uh, but for those of you who know England, you might not know this particular neck of the woods, but it's the north of England. I live in Leeds. There seems to be little doubt that his attacks in the north of England started as far back as 1969, when he put a large stone in a sock and hit a prostitute over the head with it. He said he'd been ripped off by a prostitute in Bradford and wanted to get his own back. It was sort of investigated, and I'll say that carefully, it was sort of investigated, but the victim, the prostitute, was loath to get involved with the police, and that was often the case back then. It probably still is. The working girls didn't like to involve the police, it was bad for business and the police were seen as the enemy. In September of the same year, he was found by a police officer hiding in some bushes in a suburb of Bradford, a well-known red light area, in possession of a hammer. He was arrested for the offence of going equipped for crime, which was then and still is a catch-all if you've nothing else. And that's how it was recorded. So we have Sutcliffe recorded as committing a crime in 1969 of going equipped for a crime. I think from the top of my head it was section 25 of the Theft Act. But I'm probably wrong because it's a long time since I've studied it. But I did study it. He told the officer he was looking for a hubcap that had fallen off his car. And he was convicted and fined £25. Not man found in bushes with a hammer, 
None of that was written down, just going equipped for crime. But even if it had, there was no linkage of crime recording from division to division and from force to force. It was the same all over the country. It was done on small index cards and in officers' heads. It was a poor system, but it was the best and only system we had. Jump forward now to July 1975. A woman was attacked in Keithley, and a month later a woman was attacked in Halifax. Both attacks taking place uh, at night. They were both attacked by hammer blows to the back of the head. That they survived is entirely due to the skill of the surgeons, because Sutcliffe thought he'd kill them, because that's what he intended to do. And for good measure, he also attacked a 14-year-old girl in August that year too. And she was just walking home late at night. And he tried to befriend, befriend her before hitting her on the head with the hammer. As a car drove by, he pushed her into some bushes. He ran off and she survived. Thank goodness. Can you do the next slide, please? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. We're I'm, I'm back in advanced. Oh, oh, keep, keep it on, keep it on. It'll save you back in, moving backwards and forwards. Um, it was never linked to this series of, of attacks for many, many years. He was never charged with it, but admitted it in 1992, well after his convictions. And he said, he said to us said that she was a prostitute. This was a 14-year-old girl. It's nonsense. But neither these particular parts, Keithley, Silsden or Halifax, have red light areas. And the victims had nothing to do with the, the sex trade. Geographically, Keithley and Halifax are not close, and in police terms back then, they might as well have been in two different countries. The crimes were never linked, and filers undetected for years to come. When he started killing his when he started his killing spree, technology really, really was in the dark ages compared to now. No CCTV. These are just images that I've put together over the years just to just, just signify uh, what we didn't have. No CCTV, no automatic number plate recognition, no mobile phones. Can you imagine in life without mobile phones? Well, we didn't have them. We detected crime, miraculously. No computerised incident rooms. And probably, most, um, most important of all, the double helix. DNA. Not for the first time I mentioned this and make no apologies for it. And it's somewhat ironic because at Cambridge where... In 1953, Watson and Trick, of course, announced to the world they discovered the meaning of life. Not the Douglas Adams or the Monty Python version, the real meaning of life. But this was the real thing, the double helix. Later developed by Professor Sir Alec Jeffries at the University of Leicester in 1984. In my humble opinion, I said I wouldn't give opinions, this is an opinion. In my humble opinion, it's the greatest advance in forensic detection and elimination, of course, that the world has ever seen. I cannot stress how important it is and how it would have been in this series of murders. That's not hindsight. It's a fact. Next one, please. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'll, it might be easy. Is it just that one? Yeah. Forgive me for this. I've never operated like this before. <laughs> the best that was available was blood groupings, and I'm told even now that that's, that's been thrown into debate. But, and fingerprints. Not that Sutcliffe left any. We had the PNC, the Police National Computer, for checking registration numbers of vehicles, but that was it really. On a personnel side, uh, we had some very clever and experienced detectives, but that was never going to be enough. Add, this, add, to, add it to the mix was on the 1st of April 1974, a huge reorganisation had taken place in the police service. Gone were the former city forces all over the country, mine included, and we merged to become West Yorkshire Metropolitan Police. But there were rivalries at the top of the CID. Some senior CID officers from city forces saw it as a takeover rather than a merger, and it didn't help. This is the first known murder victim, Wilhelmina McCann. Everybody called her Wilma. She was found on the outskirts of Leeds by a milkman on his rounds at 5am. He thought it was a Guy Fawkes that had just been left abandoned in a field. The head of Leeds CID described her as a good time girl in the euphemistic police jargon of the time, and that's how it was. 
Wilma had three young children and was separated from the father of these children, but she wasn't a prostitute. She had no convictions for it, but she liked to drink and was known to have sex with strangers for money. While waiting for their mother to come home on this particular night, the two older children walked to the local bus stop to wait in vain for her. Then they went home and put themselves to bed. I think the oldest at that time was seven. They'd done that before more than once. But it was a particularly brutal murder. The back of her head had been damaged with what looked like blows from a hammer, and her torso had been severely mutilated with a variety of implements or weapons. It was a start to a consistent pattern the killings had started. Three months after the murder of Wilma, Emily Jackson was found dead just outside the city centre of Leeds in a derelict alleyway. Emily was married and she lived in the south of Leeds in a suburb. She sold her body for sex from time to time, usually in the back of her old van. This is really sordid. The family had fallen on hard times and she was desperate to earn extra money. And it was to cost her her life. When the post-mortem was carried out, and Emily was not what the detectives wanted to hear. It bore all the hallmarks of the first killing, which had been thoroughly but fruitlessly investigated. It's a paradox, really, because in a perverse way it can actually help. An inquiry for a similar one is committed, but not when you have no forensic evidence and certainly no witnesses. Irene Richardson found on a well-known park, one of the largest parks in Leeds, an area called Roundhay Park. She had three children and they'd all been put into foster care. She wasn't equipped to deal with them, to care for them. And actually, another irony, in 2012 one of her children finally managed to trace his mother through an adoption agency site and found out that she'd been a victim of Sutcliffe. And I cannot imagine how he felt, but an indirect victim, if you like, of of this man. With these killings, the timing seemed to be random, but the pattern was the same. The body had been mutilated in almost exactly the same way. But this time, tyre tracks were found. And this generated a whole new inquiry, and thousands of cars entered the system. And we were always playing catch up, but he had a head start. The then head of CID in the foreground, a guy called Detective Chief Superintendent Dennis Hoban, uh, who was one of the nicest men I ever met in my life, certainly in my service. He died uh, very, very sadly and very, very suddenly, and he was massively missed. But even Dennis uh, was baffled by these murders, as was everybody else. And to me, that was the acid test as a very young detective. If Dennis doesn't know how to solve these things, who the hell does it? It's just, that's how it was. This Samuel Bradford, Patricia Atkinson was a, pros a prostitute, and, uh, as was Jean Richardson, as I mentioned before. Uh, this lady was the only known victim to have been found in the house. Again, uh, this time back to Bradford, uh, in the notorious uh, red light district. But there was no pattern, as I mentioned before. They seemed to be totally, totally random attacks. Oh, sorry. It's all right. This one was the one that, this was almost the straw that broke the camel's back. This is Jane MacDonald, and Jane was 16 years of age when she was found dead, and she worked in a shop. No connections whatever with the sex trade. And this seemed to be the catalyst the inquiry needed. Sutcliffe had been given the sobriquet, the Yorkshire Ripper, by the local morning uh, newspaper, the Yorkshire Post, by now, and boy did that take off. Even we use the expression. The man put in charge of this inquiry now was an assistant chief constable, George Oldfield, uh, and he vowed to catch him if it was the last thing, it, last thing he did, and it very nearly was. Oldfield was a very experienced detective and had responsibility in West Yorkshire for all crime investigations. But everywhere there's panic and alarm, women's groups, People travelling on buses, separate buses being put on at night time. Leeds has got a massive student population. Everybody was walking around in fear. I can't tell you how bad it was. It was just awful. 
Awful time to be around and to be a woman. The next victim was Jean Jordan and she was found in Manchester and a clue was about to be delivered into the hands of the police. A real clue. A handbag was missing but an extensive search of the wasteland where she'd be found left, found it. Inside the secret compartment in the handbag was a five pound note. A very new five pound note that she'd been given by Sutcliffe in advance to entice her into his car. It later transpired he returned to the scene to try and find this five pound note but he'd been unable to do so. So he threw the handbag as far as he could. Search actually revealed the handbag. He thought it could be linked to the money and he was right because he'd been given it in his pay packet. Back then a lot of people were paid weekly and in cash. With the assistance of the Bank of England, the note was traced to, the, to a, a, a suburb of Bradford called Shipley, um, a branch of the Midland Bank, and as part of a consignment sent to 34 businesses and traders in the area. One of them was a company called T&W, Clark and Engineering Company, which employed Sutcliffe as a lorry driver. He was interviewed twice by different detectives in relation to this £5 note inquiry, but he had no £5 notes left uh, by this stage, and his wife Sonia provided an alibi for him. In time, another 8,000 people would be interviewed in relation to this enquiry. It was later revisited by the head of Greater Manchester at CID, and the list had been whittled down of potential suspects to 250. And of course, Sutcliffe was one of them. In December 1977, a prostitute called Madeline Moore, who I had met professionally, I hasten to add, was attacked and left for dead in a suburb of Leeds. Late at night, she suffered horrendous head injuries, but Sutcliffe was disturbed by a dog barking and he drove off, leaving her for dead. She made this photo of it, <coughs> but it was discounted by the powers that be, as was she. She was described, and I kid you not, she was described as a drunken slut. What does she know? Well, as far as we were concerned, She's the only one that had survived and seen him properly, so I think the photo of it, um, it stands the test of time. But she also said her attacker called himself Dave, but preferred to be called David. And she'd been picked up by him to do business, of course. So that was it then. We were looking for a guy called Dave. No one seemed to believe. And I am shaking my head still in disbelief after all this time. No one seemed to believe that her attacker could have used a false name. He was safe again. Inquiries continued across both sides of the Pennines. It was non-stop. Thousands of people were interviewed and eliminated. Some as a result of tyre tracks from vehicles. It was the original plaster cast in the, in the soil, like you see on old movies. Some wives even suggested husbands as being responsible as they'd fallen out with them. But they all had to be investigated. Some were seen in red light areas on two or three occasions, and that was enough to be interviewed. Police unmarked cars, there's a, an oxymoron if ever there was one, were trying to carry out covert observations, sat in these cars with handheld tape recorders this big, pressed down to speak, rewind forward, get more cassette tapes in. It was hard work, and it was leading nowhere. Not that this presence ever seemed to put him off, because Yvonne Pearson was the next victim. Sorry, this is Helen Ritka. Uh, she was uh, she was a twin, was Helen. They had quite a, her, her and a twin had a dreadful early life, and they were worked, both worked as prostitutes to make ends meet in Huddersfield. Uh, they were usually very careful and always arranged to meet up after each session with a punter, as they called them. Uh, but not this time. And she was found dead in a timber merchant's yard. She was the next. He was moving further afield again. Leeds, Bradford, Huddersfield. It's like Leeds, Bradford, Manchester, and now Huddersfield. Vera Milbert was the next one, and uh, she was a prostitute who worked in Manchester. And she was really, really ill. Uh, she had massive health problems, and she was found on some wasteland in Manchester. And she was found, for those of you, you're probably a bit young to be, Coronation Street aficionados, but there was a character in there called 
Les Battersby quite some time ago, and she was found by him. That's his only claim to fame, because he was a dreadful actor. Josephine Whittaker was walking across a lovely park in Halifax. She spent the evening with her grandparents close by. Sutcliffe went up to her and asked her what time it was, and then he killed her. The injuries again, fitting this all too familiar pattern. And she worked at the Halifax Building Society, a very, very respectable young lady with her life ahead of her, as indeed the, old, all the other victims, of course, irrespective of what they did for a living. If it was back before, it was about to get a whole lot worse. Mr Oldfield had been sent two letters. The editor of the Daily Mirror in Manchester was sent one, and the contents were not released for some time. But more infamously, Oldfield was sent a cassette tape. Can you play that cassette, please, Julie? Thank you. Hmm? Now personal. Oh, sorry. It was the, it was the Ripper against George Oldfield, or was it? A press conference was held at the West Yorkshire Police Academy on the, in June 1979. Oldfield chaired it, and I'll paraphrase what he said at the time: "We know that we're definitely looking for a man who originated in the northeast of England. I am convinced." that this is the man who has murdered 11 women. Now, there'd only actually been 10 women in the series, but he included a woman uh, found in Lancashire, murdered in Lancashire, uh, by the name of Joan Harrison. And he talks about, in previous letters, that there was information which only could be known by the killer. There is no doubt that he was born in the Sunderland or the Sunderland area. The net to catch him spread far and wide. I met a passenger on a cruise who lived in Hampshire, and he'd been brought up in the Castletown area. Um, where, these, where this voice had ad been identified as coming from. He was given a hard time, it left a nasty taste, but the, the tape had been analysed by voice experts who were as certain as they could be that the person responsible was for, for spent his formative years in the castle town area of Sunderland. But the experts never said that the person responsible was the killer. They weren't qualified, but it was an assumption the police made and acted upon. It was on billboards, in newspapers, on the television, work, played in working men's clubs, especially in the Sunderland area. There was a dedicated phone line, generated more inquiries, more paperwork. A team of officers from Leeds were sent to work uh, with their counterparts in Wearside. They interviewed thousands of people in the Castletown area. What it did do overall to the inquiry was eliminate anyone without a North East accent. Barbara Leach uh, was the next one. Barbara was a student at the University of Bradford and her body was found hidden under some rubbish, a discarded body. It bore all the hallmarks of a ripper attack. One of my dearest friends and was actually the family liaison officer, I'm quite sure you've heard uh, that, uh, that term family liaison officer to Barbara's parents who were from the Northampton area. They were devastated. They probably still are. Marguerite Walls was the next one, a conscientious civil servant 
walking home after working late. She had never worked late this particular night she did. And it was the last time she walked home. She was found abandoned. The body was just discarded like a piece of garden refuse. It wasn't initially thought to be part of the series that she'd been strangled. <coughs> I'll come on to this one now because I think it's the most relevant one. Jacqueline Hill uh, was an English student at the University of Leeds and she'd hopes of becoming a probation officer. She was found in Headingley in Leeds, uh, an area I know like the back of my hand and I travel past it um, every couple of weeks or so even still. Many, many mistakes were made prior to her body being found. Um, I am well aware that this was the, the part of the talk that the young man who complimented me on giving it uh, was particularly interested in because it covers what I'm about to talk about although I'm not going to cover it it covers the law of tour that you study don't you yeah everybody's nodding well you should do otherwise you won't be here unless you just nosy a handbag had been found uh, with what appeared to be bloodstains on it but the scene wasn't searched Inside the handbag was her name and address, and she lived less than 100 metres away from where the handbag was found. No one went to her house to check on her well-being. By anyone's standards, this was badly handled. They weren't all, this one was in particular. Instead of the inquiries being made to trace where Jacqueline was, her handbag, with bloodstains on it, was logged into a police station as lost property. I know it's uh, of relevance to uh, Jacqueline's mother, Mrs Doreen Hill, because she's the one who took the case that ended up at the Supreme Court. Jacqueline, of course, was the last victim. This is where uh, the, the incident room was. This is Milgar Street Police Station, where my wife and I, well, actually, my wife and I met there, which is rather a nice thing. We met, and it's such a long time ago, and we've been together ever since. It's the only good thing that ever came out of this inquiry. But this is a long time. Back in the 1970s, this was a state-of-the-art building. State-of-the-art for 1970s. And it's now uh, a John Lewis car park in the centre of Leeds. Progress. But when the Ripper investigation was at its high... There was such an amount of paperwork inside on the fourth floor of this building that it was in danger, the floor was in danger of collapsing. They got structural engineers in to test the strength of the floors. Desks, filing cabinets were moved to the outside. Tables and desks full to capacity with box index systems. Thousands and thousands of names were in there. And of course, Sutcliffe's name was in there too, many times over. The main indices were called nominal index for names and vehicle index. Teams of detectives, usually working in pairs, very backwards and forwards, delivering statements, actions, other types of paper information. It was a sea of paper. Uh, it was like, my, Andrew described it, it was like painting the fourth bridge, and it was, it was endless. Uh, one of the busiest people in the police station was the carpenter, busy making new wooden index boxes. At the height of the inquiry, this flowchart showed the comings and goings of the inquiry. The incident room was at best manic to the outsider, and most detectives, and that includes me, hated going in there. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't a welcoming environment. Index cards were regularly misfiled, names misspelt, and each new inquiry generated a new index. It was just a self-propagating monster. I mentioned... Uh, hindsight, hindsight, it's the most appropriate word I can think of. These are some examples of some of the many photo fits that um, witnesses and victims provided. And he, of course, Sutcliffe's on the top right of this. And these are some of the other images of the firm. They're, they're all not a million miles away from him. But when he was interviewed, um, and I'll come on to that in a few minutes, he didn't have a Wearside accent. So he was eliminated on that reason alone. He couldn't have possibly sent the letters or the tape because he wasn't responsible for them. At the end of January, and I do apologise for the quality of these photos, but these are the best I can get. All the, the proper stuff from the files 
He's, oh, actually, it looks, it doesn't look bad on there. It's worse on mine. Yes, it's my eyes. Um, the quality of the photographs are not, not very uh, good. End of January 1981, two South Yorkshire police officers were on duty in Knights. They were based in a suburb of Sheffield. And one of them, the one on the right, had only been in the police for seven months. I mean, he was being supervised by Bob Ring. Uh, they saw a car in an area being used by prostitutes and their clients and decided to have a look. A PNC, Police National Computer Check, revealed this big rover, as it was, the number plates, and it showed that it should have been a Skoda. Sutcliffe was asked his name, and he said he was called Peter Williams, and was with his girlfriend. She was asked and told the officer, who knew her anyway, that she was called Olivia Reavers, and she was a prostitute, but he knew that anyway. Sutcliffe was arrested on suspicion of theft of the number plates, and he asked to go for a pee in some bushes. Sergeant Ring was suspicious from the start and even asked Sutcliffe if he was the Yorkshire Ripper. And of course he said he wasn't. At the police station where they took him back in Sheffield, he was sat underneath a series of photo fits. And the station sergeant said to me, said to him, you look remarkably like those photo fits. He said, yeah, people are always saying that. He was soon to be unmasked. He was with a prostitute, he resembled the photo fits. And his car had been disguised by false number plates. He was taken to Dewsbury Police Station in the heavy woolen district of West Yorkshire to be questioned about the theft of the number plates. But as a matter of routine, the incident room in Leeds were notified. They said they were aware of him and he had been eliminated, but they were told to get their backsides in gear and get over to Dewsbury to interview uh, this man. Because of the mix of the audience, I cannot possibly say what they were told to do, but it wasn't that. I'm sure you get the picture. But no need to get excited yet, though. He didn't have a North East accent. We told the officer that Dewsbury had stolen number plates as his car wasn't insured, which is true. He was questioned by the Ripper Squad detectives and he seemed to have an answer for all their questions, although he was described as being evasive. Well, he would be, wouldn't he? And he was detained for more questioning. In the meantime, back in Sheffield, Sergeant Ring who had been a detective prior to being promoted into young, uh, as a uniform sergeant, having found out that Sutcliffe was still in custody, went back to the scene of where he'd arrested him the previous night. A hunch, a gut feeling, call it what you want. But he looked in the bushes where Sutcliffe had had a pee and he found a hammer and a screwdriver. When he went back to the toilets in the police station he was lodged in, they had overhead systems back in there. I'm sure you've seen pictures of overhead systems, not your low flush things. These are systems on top, stand on the seat, and you could lift the lid up. And that's exactly what Sutcliffe did in this police station when he asked to go to the toilet in there to hide a knife. Alarm bells rang. The detectives in Leeds were told, and Sutcliffe was confronted with this information about what had been found and where it had been found. Across the table with two very experienced detectives, he said to the officers, I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the Yorkshire Ripper. It was over. He didn't look like the monster he'd become and been portrayed as, but he was polite and softly spoken, and he had a Bradford accent. He was interviewed over several days. And there was no mention of any voices from God. Uh, that would come later. He told the detectives everything they wanted to hear and added he was responsible for the murder of the civil servant, Marguerite Walls, who had been strangled. And he died, denied the murder of the one in Preston that Mr Oldfield, the head of crime, was so insist insistently done for a very good reason. He hadn't done it. Eventually, 2008, a DNA swab was taken by, uh, from a man, you know, DNA, taken from a man for a drink driving offence and he was linked to DNA from this particular scene so it most certainly wasn't Sutcliffe. These were in his garage uh, which had never properly been uh, searched either but to be fair there are a lot of tools that most people if you're at all handy could have in your garage. The end of April 1981 court number one the old bailey was full to capacity the judge was Mr Justice Borum. Leading for the prosecution was the Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers QC, who was the father of the actor Nigel Havers. 
Sir Michael was assisted by Mr Harry Ognell, also at Queen's Council. The defence was led by James Chadwin and Sidney Levine, and the stage was set for the trial of Peter Sutcliffe, although it wasn't. Because Sutcliffe, through his barristers, told the court he was pleading guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Sir Michael Havers, for the Crown, told the court he was willing to accept this. And this was based on the statements of four psychiatrists. The defence, not surprisingly, had no objections to this course of action. His Honour did. He was not at all impressed and wanted the evidence to be tested. Paradox. Until the intervention of the judge, Sir Michael was almost arguing the case for the defence. But when the court came back after an interval of six days, he started doing the job he was supposed to do. And that was arguing that Sutcliffe was mad. Sorry, wrong way around. Was bad, not mad. A prison officer from Leeds gave evidence from Leeds Prison to the effect that he'd overheard Sutcliffe in conversation with his wife during a supervised visit. And he told the court that Sutcliffe had been overheard saying that if he played, and I apologise for what I'm about to say, it's from its time, if he played the loony card, he would go to a secure hospital where a bed had been arranged. Who came up with that idea? Sutcliffe had told psychiatrists that he'd heard voices from God, but he must have forgotten to tell police this, although in interview, because he didn't. Uh, but by the time Mr. Mr. Ognall had finished with him, he probably wanted to meet his maker face to face sooner rather than later. Harry Ognall, who I came across as a detective, was a legal terrier, but a very, very nice man too. But one of the best uh, barristers I've ever come across in my life. But Sutcliffe in the witness box was torn to shreds and the medical men didn't escape either. The psychiatric evidence was based almost entirely on what he told them, as the judge had intimated. He was found guilty on 13 counts of murder and 7 counts of attempted murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. This, then, is the only known photograph of John Humble. Humble was the author of the tape you've heard and the letters. He was a wreck of a man, a lonely alcoholic with a grudge against the police stretching back years. In his deluded mind, he said he was helping them. He lived in Sunderland, but he hadn't been interviewed about the Ripper tape inquiry. But he's nothing to worry about on that score. He wasn't the killer. He was finally caught in 2005, a long, long time afterwards, thanks to some brilliant detective work and brilliant forensic science work. And I'm just about to use the little fabulous three initials again, DNA. He was caught with DNA retrieved from the original envelope. I make it sound easy, and I've just done that in a few seconds, but it was anything but easy. Uh, they had one go at this, I think. But unusually for this type of offence, he was convicted of perverting the course of justice and he actually received eight years imprisonment. I think everybody gave, gave a very large hallelujah because that sort of sentence, although uh, probably not enough, is quite a lot for perverting the course of justice. He derailed it. There's no doubt about that, he derailed it and probably caused the deaths of a further three victims. I worked on it, uh, I mentioned earlier, and it's easy for me to say that, um, but I didn't believe the veracity of the, of the, of the tape. Um, I honestly didn't, uh, neither did most of my colleagues. But we were told uh, what the elimination points were, the parameters, and we had to abide by them, and there was nothing, nothing else. One particular detective was so sure he'd been face-to-face -face with the Ripper i.e. Sutcliffe, he put a report in, asking for Sutcliffe to be arrested. But it was ignored, because Sutcliffe didn't meet the criteria at the time. He had a gut feeling, and he was a very good detective. Almost, uh, one of the inspir most uh, inspirational people I've ever met in my life is Richard McCann, the son of Wilma McCann, the first victim. Richard's a motivational speaker and a best-selling author. <coughs> He turned his life around in Richard. Uh, I've seen him uh, give talks to high schools where I'm a governor uh, at uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, but his elder sister, Sonia, the one who led them Pied Piper style back to the house, uh, wasn't so lucky. After years of torment, Sonia finally um, took her own life. But let's have a look at Sonia. Sonia Sutcliffe, the daughter of migrants from Czechoslovakia, as it was back in the 19th. 
1940s, early 1950s. Before she married Sutcliffe, she'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had spent time in a mental hospital. Was this how Sutcliffe came up with the idea? Lots of people think it was. She, but she provided alibis on every occasion that he was interviewed by the police. But to be fair, uh, a wife or a partner alibi never really rules anyone out. But there seemed to be nothing else to link him to any of these attacks. He was interviewed a total of nine times, but on each occasion, Sonia provided an alibi. Almost without exception, though, it was by different teams of detectives, so by the time they got the report back, it was found in different places, and they were unaware how many times he'd been interviewed. Sutcliffe was vague when he'd been asked. They were aware he'd been interviewed before, but no matter what the detective thought or said, there was no escaping the fact he didn't have a Wearside accent. He was fireproof. One of the most asked questions has been, did Sonia Sutcliffe know what husband was doing and had done? Well, it's a question that a lot of people have their own views on. Uh, we'll never know for sure. The satirical, private eye, uh, satirical magazine Private Eye uh, alleged she, she profited by her husband's murders by selling her story to anyone that would listen. Uh, friends of Sutcliffe were offered money to sell their stories too, and the stories went to the highest bidders. This was checkbook journalism at its worst. She took private eye to court, and she was awarded £600,000 in damages for defamation of character. Ian Hislop, the editor of Private Eye, then famously stood on the steps of the High Court in London after the award had been made and said, if that's justice, then I'm a banana. On appeal, the amount was massively reduced, but the question will never go away. Over a quarter of a million people were interviewed, 150,000 vehicles checked, and in modern terms, it probably cost about £30 million. It was unprecedented. As far as human costs are concerned, it's impossible to quantify. Every single fam family of each victim suffered their own loss, their own grief, and their own what might have been. It goes on to this day, it's never ending. Oldfield died two years after retiring, and he was a broken man. Was he another indirect victim? On the subject of indirect victims, I found out fairly recently that one of my mentors, when I was a young detective, took his own life a few years after the Jacqueline Hill murder. He had supervised the uniformed sergeant who had decided to enter this particular handbag into lost property. And he couldn't live with himself. He hanged himself in his garage. And I only found that out less than two years ago. The uniformed sergeant, whom I knew and worked with for on one occasion, uh, went on to have a stellar career in the police service. A Home Office report, a Home Office inquiry, uh, was carried out under the leadership of Sir Lawrence Byford, who was the Chief and Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, and heads rolled. Lessons were learned, that's for certain, but it had to be a blame game with no stone left unturned. One of Byford's many, many conclusions were the last three murders could and should have been prevented because too much emphasis was placed on the tape. Incident rooms were chased forever, homes, the Home Office large major inquiry system was launched, and homes too that linked forces. Uh, was instigated in 1999. I hope uh, we'll never see the lights again. I don't think we will, thanks to the advances in technology and policing. We never will. Sutcliffe was a sexual sadist who gained gratification through the act of killing. It's as simple as that. No woman was safe from him, from him between 1969 until 1980. The story is now confined to history books and theatres like this one, but from the families who still wonder what might have been. Sutcliffe will never ever be released, having been made the subject of a whole life. Tariff is in what I call a proper prison, is in HMP Durham, uh, where he's been for the last, uh, HMP Franklin, sorry, in Durham. He now calls himself Peter, New Peter Coonan. I don't care what he calls himself, what I do care about is the victims and their 
surviving relatives. But for the victims, him being where he is, is the best. It's the only justice they can ever have. Thank you for listening.